So as much as possible, insulate the WTO as an organization from whatever difficulties the members are having in the negotiations. And that is why we went through an extensive process. We ended up with elements that we agreed on, and we ended up with elements that were not agreed on, and it went the way it did. Uh, so at the end of the day, uh, it's not in my position to say whether we were successful or not, but uh, I think we achieved the initial objective of having a successful conference, after which people will still be able to talk together, rather than the kind of experience we had in Seattle and uh, Cancun. So I think uh, that's what we have had. We had some useful outcomes, the accessions of Russia, Federation, Vanuatu, and Montenegro. We got commitment from ministers to resist protectionism, even, if the, even though there are differences as to what that means, just as Giant had said. Uh, we got seven decisions, and most important of all, the decision on LDC accessions. Um, I think at the end of MC8, members are better placed to understand how to strengthen the, uh, the multilateral trading system, particularly through the mandate on the work in the regular bodies, uh, especially the Committee on Trade and Development, the Dispute Settlement Understanding, <coughs> and Aid for Trade. I think the overall picture we try to bring out is that the WTO is more than the round. And I think uh, this has come out. However, the real challenges to the organization up to now still remain the uh, DDA negotiations, uh, which for me were very evident both in the preparatory process and in the ministerial itself. I heard different kinds of things, concerns about uh, even at the outcome, explore different negotiating approaches to overcome fundamental stalemates, to advance negotiations where progress may be achieved. I mean, these are more like best uh, endeavor language, which uh, negotiators call, the, call the constructive ambiguity, so that everybody can find a place to identify with at the end of the day. So interpretation becomes the challenge. And I think that is part of the problem we have in trying to decide on how best uh, we would get the organization back on its mandate in the context of a work program post MC8. Uh, I think something that we must not lose sight of is that the Doha round is unique. I'm sure Mr. Raghavan may confirm that almost all the previous rounds were based on some kind of uh, transatlantic balancing. So as the EU kept expanding, the US needed some new round of negotiations to gain some better access. So the, the purpose the intent and whatever approach was different. But now you have more players, like Giant had said, and therefore the game has become different and difficult. And it has become more difficult because of not really the recent uh, global economic uh, environment, which is still part of the problem, but fundamentally because there are concerns about competitiveness. If we look at some of the major players that are losing market shares, both in their domestic markets and in their export markets. So this is part of the problem. And with the global economic uh, uh, downturn, I think that kind of worsened the situation to create part of the challenges we have today. I agree with Giant that uh, the interest of the business sector in this round has not been very strong like in previous rounds. Uh, 
I agree with him on the challenges presented by the new issues. But here again, we need, from what I heard from the uh, preparatory process for MC8, we need to try to achieve a balance between two opposing views. Those who ask for new issues argue that uh, the WTO will lose its credibility if it does not respond to new challenges. I think that's a valid point. If the WTO does not respond to an issue like climate change, then the rules that emerge in the climate change negotiations and have impact on trade would have been determined by non-trade experts. Then we would have to start fighting to pick the pieces. Equally, the other side of the debate is uh, like uh, the ambassador of Mauritius, uh, Ebli, put it, we cannot be talking of 21st century issues when we have not finished the 19th uh, century issues. So that too is valid. So as developing countries, we need to begin to see how to address these challenges. And I also uh, share the view, agree with Giant on the issue of uh, leadership vacuum. I think this is very, very uh, central in what we are doing. But when you come to leadership vacuum, I think that's where the problem uh, starts. If you look at this room, we are supposed to be mostly developing countries, but we are not homogeneous. So in the conclusions I drew from the uh, preparatory process is that the divisions in the WTO are not about North and South. They are about self-mercantile interests. Mercantile interests that are hinged on the traditional theory of more exports and less imports. So, and I'm saying this with every sense of honesty because China is not Nigeria, India is not Rwanda, and the stake in the system is different. Even amongst the LDCs, Bangladesh is not Benin, because in terms of certain sectors, Bangladesh has achieved certain levels of competitiveness. <clears throat> so if everybody is looking after himself, then I believe we would always continue to have these difficulties. And often, what I see is a situation whereby some of the developed countries will be coming to us to say, look, I am the one, particularly from Africa, I am the one to best serve your interest. And I believe many of us here who have participated in the African Union Ministers of Trade meeting will confirm this. We invite the US, we invite the EU, we invite India, we invite China, and each of them will tell you the other person is the problem. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you have no solution. So if really this challenge of development is real, then even our brothers who are better off to do in the developing world should be able to discuss with us clearly to see what can be done to resolve the problem for the majority of the developing world to benefit. Otherwise, what I see at present is that based on the mercantilist, uh, prevailing mercantilist interest, nobody wants to do anything, so they are taking comfort in each other. I won't do this because this major player is doing this. And I think that kind of message came out very eloquently from Giant's uh, uh, presentation. Another area that I thought we need that wasn't touched, which I think I should touch, is the emerging theologic, theological debate in the WTO about the role of emerging economies. This is something we need to think about. This is something we need to reflect on. This is something that UNCTAD can be required to make some analysis, and even uh, the South Center can contribute. My thinking is that if the WTO took on board the UN classification of countries, which does not specify 
when and how a country graduates from LDC to developing or from developing. No, I think there's some criteria for from least developed to developing, but there's no criteria for developing to developed. It means somebody has to come out and say, today I am developed. So you may have an income per capita of uh, $50,000, uh, maybe like uh, Korea, but you can still go and sit amongst uh, developing countries. So we need to have that kind of an understanding of what this really means. And I believe that would enable us to get into some clarity as to whether we stick together in terms of obligations or we stick together in terms of solidarity and how the organization can be moved forward. Uh, and I, I believe the sooner the developing countries have a discussion on this matter amongst themselves, the better. Because the accession of the Russian Federation will complicate the politics. If we are not careful, we'll be pulled aside from three different dimensions. Because each of the players will have its own interest. It will have its own strategies for uh, getting into, uh, in, 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 into the real uh, uh, text, into the real uh, politics of the organization. How do developing countries react in this kind of uh, environment? I think uh, all of us should make the preservation of the integrity and credibility of the multilateral trading system as a priority. I mean, in the light of the presentation by Bangladesh, I don't think I need to uh, speak more on that, because that is the best way we can get any fair deal. We need to be proactive in what we do. In most of the discussions I have seen, we only react. We don't set the agenda. And the only way you can set the agenda is by looking at where people have their defensive interests. Because what we do is about our offensive and defensive interests. So if somebody doesn't want to talk about domestic uh, uh, support in agriculture, you should be able to make domestic support in agriculture your issue. Because that is where you have your offensive interests. That delegation will never ever put forward an agenda for you on domestic support. And most of the times, we wait until somebody comes up with a proposal, and then we begin to react. And this brings me to the issue of the continuing upsurge in RTAs and uh, the current uh, challenge of a plurilateral uh, RTA, FTA on services. Uh, to my mind, which is a view I've always expressed, uh, Article 5 of the GATS is akin to Article 24 of GAT. So if somebody wants to do an RTA, uh, an FTA in services, you need to go elsewhere. Although I'm aware that some feel if you do it in Geneva, there will be transparency and it will be better, but I don't think so because that is not part of the negotiations. Part of the mandate for the negotiations is you can unilaterally produce your schedule without asking for anything in return. You can do, do it bilaterally, or you can do it plurilaterally. But at the end of the day, the final outcome goes into your schedule and applies MFM. So whereas we have if you have an FTA in services under Article 5, it's supposed to be just like any of the FTAs we have around. And here is the problem. Uh, I have looked at all the WTO disciplines and uh, jurisprudence uh, on RTAs, and you will see that there has been very little uh, kind of work. I think in the DSU, we have never had any. In the Committee on Regional Trade Agreements, there have been notifications. In the Committee on Trading Goods, there have been notifications. But none of these notifications have been taken through, and yet those FTAs are operating. 
So if we really don't want to get this uh, negative uh, understanding of new approaches, we need to begin to look how we can bring the disciplines in some of these uh, uh, existing uh, regular bodies to work better, how this can be applied under the DSU, and I believe the MC8 uh, provided a mandate uh, on that. Uh, without trying to take uh, too much time, uh, let me uh, conclude by saying that all the discussions I have heard so far, and even um, from what my previous speakers uh, have said, is yet to touch on the central issue. The central issue is, are you abandoning the round or are you uh, concluding it? I think that is what we need to, that is what we also need to reflect on so that we are prepared as to what happens. We are prepared that if the round is not concluded, this could be our own uh, alternatives, just like others are putting forward their own alternatives to the round as if it has already failed. So we shouldn't keep our hope alive by just saying, well, the round will be concluded based on its development mandate, which has now come to mean different things to different people. Uh, I thank you all. Thank you very much. That was a very frank uh, personal assessment from the perspective of one who led the process. Uh, I now invite uh, Ambassador Faisal Ismail from South Africa. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. You put me in a, in a very difficult situation because uh, all the points I wanted to, be, to make have been made, and I've, uh, I've had to rewrite my speech several times. <laughs> so um, what I thought I'd do is um, I'll try and, um, and the other thing you have done, uh, Mr. Chairman, is um, you haven't invited the EU or the US uh, so that I could engage with somebody. So why I say that uh, is because they're very much uh, in my mind as I speak. <clears throat> I'm going to try to, to uh, uh, address two questions. Uh, the first, uh, is the Doha round dead? And the second, uh, what is the way forward? And I thought what I'd, I'd do is um, I would uh, discuss with you what the narrative is. You know, what are they saying, those, those people are, that are not here? You know, what are they saying about the Doha round and, and the way forward? And what is, what is the reality <coughs> um, that, that uh, we face? Now, uh, <coughs> Jayant, of course, has gone through the history uh, of the round. Uh, but just to remind you, <coughs> in 2008, uh, the, the ministerial meetings collapsed, uh, and of course it was it was the um, a change in, in the administration from the Republicans to the um, new Obama administration. So I'll focus on what what the Obama administration has been saying. In the first few months, they they all said the same thing. Uh, the new um, officials, Ron Kirk, Michael Punk, and others. They said that um, what is on the table in the Doha round is not good enough. There's too little market access. They said that the world uh, is changing. And in this new world, the new emerging countries, those uh, on the right, uh, China and India and, and others, um, unfortunately, they include South Africa. They say that these countries are growing. They are uh, gaining more market share. Uh, they're becoming more economically significant, and therefore their responsibilities must change. And therefore, what they've committed in the round is not good enough. They have to do more. Now, <clears throat> we've heard this uh, repeated over and over again in 2009, in 2010, in 2011. And so when uh, Pascal Lamy wrote his uh, letter to ministers inviting them to MC8, he repeated the argument. He said, the main reason for the impasse is the difference in the perspectives of members about the roles and responsibilities of the developed countries 
vis-a-vis -vis the major emerging countries. So here's the, the main reason for the impasse. So this is the narrative. Now, what is the, uh, what is the reality? Now, it seems to me that um, what, what the Americans have been saying is they're saying they are liberalizers. They are uh, more open or they're an open economy. <clears throat> they want to liberalize. The emerging countries are closed economies. They don't want to liberalize. They're not putting enough on the table. And they're playing the game unfairly. The rules, uh, they're not playing by the rules. And they're also saying that these countries are growing and these countries um, must contribute more than they have already and they, that they have been contributing as developing countries. Now, uh, let me just quote for you uh, um, a, um, uh, something that has been written by uh, a former Indian ambassador who has had some experience here uh, negotiating with the U.S. bilaterally. And he says that we should remember that the U.S. has de defensive red lines across the range of negotiating areas, agricultural subsidies, carve-outs in agricultural market access, the cotton issue, 100% duty-free, quota-free market access, zeroing and anti-dumping investigations, stronger disciplines on standards, disciplines for services subsidies, mode for market access in services, and the list is very long. So even in the Doha round, we know that this posture of the US is not quite sink in with the, the reality. <clears throat> but secondly, the US says and, uh, uh, that what's on the table is not good enough. Now, um, <clears throat> there are a number of uh, writers uh, who've analyzed this, including the World Bank. They've done some studies. Um, Martin, uh, uh, Martin uh, uh, Koh, of course, has written uh, a lot about NAMA and the impact of the NAMA formula on developing countries and the extent to which uh, we have uh, contributed um, and uh, 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 will be contributing uh, in the Doha round if those formulas as they are um, continue to uh, remain on the table. Um, and many of these studies um, including Pascal Lamy, who said that what's on the table is at least two or three times the commitments that were made in the, in the Uruguay round. Uh, and even one of the big uh, US uh, uh, institutes, uh, the uh, Peterson Institute, um, argued that um, what's on the table is uh, good enough um, for, uh, for the United States and other developed countries. So, that argument is, is actually um, not uh, um, absolutely correct. <clears throat> there are many people who disagree with that. And then there's the argument that developing countries are now uh, you know, big. They are, uh, <clears throat> they are uh, um, gaining market share, um, and therefore they should contribute more. But the reality, again, is that um, you know, if you look at per capita incomes, as uh, my colleague from Nigeria just pointed out, I mean, China has been growing, but its GDP, its GDP per capita is still uh, 15 times less than the US. And in the case of India, the US has a per capita GDP which is 47 times that of India. And by the way, uh, the South Center has a good article on this in their last issue, looking at um, the argument about uh, the, the, <clears throat> the uh, developing countries and their level of development compared to the developed countries. Much has been made also about China and its, uh, its uh, um, new role as the largest exporting country in the world. But I think there's a, there are a lot of misconceptions that arise out of these uh, uh, apparent facts. Because when you look more closely at what China is exporting, what is the, the value added? What is the value of what it's exporting? and the contribution of value added that China makes to the bulk of its uh, um, exports, which are made up of inter intermediate goods. Uh, I think uh, this, has, uh, this has created uh, a lot of debate. And even in the WTO, there's a discussion about reviewing the way we produce trade data, because uh, the data doesn't uh, uh, accurately reflect. 
the value added that is contributed in, in export. Now, um, having said that, uh, what, what is the way forward that is being proposed? Now, uh, we, we know uh, from uh, some discussions that took place amongst um, uh, the private sector in the uh, lobbies in the US uh, earlier in July last year, and again this year in January, and in a number of papers that have been produced uh, by the Australians um, uh, and others, uh, and, and the uh, statements that have been made by the US and Australia that they want to pursue other pathways uh, towards liberalization, new approaches, because they say that the current approaches being used in the Doha round are not yielding results. And one of those is this uh, so-called uh, plurilateral in services. They are assuming that uh, you know, the Doha round will not uh, be able to produce sufficient market access and liberalization. Uh, and they're also assuming that the Doha is not doable. And therefore, they need to find other ways of uh, liberalizing. Now, uh, I think what, uh, what this approach uh, suggests, again, you know, it's the same narrative, that they want to liberalize, that they are open. But what it doesn't disclose is that the real reasons for the impasse in the round really have to do with three reasons, in my view. The first being that um, these demands that the US has put on the table for developing countries goes way beyond the mandate. And in fact, they're totally unreasonable, even by the standards of uh, you know, many objective observers, including the World Bank. Uh, secondly, um, the uh, approach that the US uh, and others are taking is a distinct uh, shift from the development mandate of the round which uh, has focused on some of the implementation issues that uh, uh, Jayanth has pointed out, but also which has uh, focused our attention on the inequalities in agricultural trade or the inequity between agricultural trade and other goods trade. Um, and this new approach that the US and, and Australia and others are taking uh, is an attempt to abandon the approach that we took in Doha to focus on these issues. And thirdly, I think the approach, uh, these new approaches are trying to deny the reality that the, f the focus and the priority of the Doha round is on the delivery to LDCs. And the inability of the US to deliver to LDCs, um, I think is, uh, <clears throat> Is, uh, uh, has been one of the major reasons for the failure uh, of the round thus far. Now, um, there are, of course, uh, these new pathways, are, I think, also uh, have some systemic implications. I mean, the first systemic implication is that um, the development mandate uh, of the round will be undermined because the focus on agriculture, on LDCs, on SND um, will, uh, as I said, will, uh, will now um, uh, be lost. Secondly, um, if there is an attempt to negotiate piece by piece or standalone issues like services, it will abandon the single undertaking. Now, why is a single undertaking important? It's important because in Doha we agreed that a number of these issues will move together so that we are able to leverage some um, areas where developed countries want access into developing country markets in order to ensure that we get the reforms that we want in agriculture in developed countries. So there was going to be a linkage between these two issues. But if you, start, if you, if you dismantle the single undertaking and you, do, you try and negotiate issues piece by piece, you lose that leverage, and you then don't have the possibility for gain any reforms in agriculture in developed countries, or to secure the delivery of um, some issues like uh, LDCs, um, uh, duty-free, quota-free. Now, what should the developing countries do? I think developing countries have spoken very clearly. At MC8, um, 
with the vast majority of uh, countries and members of the WTO came together in the Friends of Development Declaration, um, over 100 countries, and they have said very clearly that they want the Doha mandate to um, uh, be the basis for any further negotiation, the development mandate of the round. They want to, uh, they recommit to that. They urge everyone else to do the same. Second, they want the single undertaking to, to remain. Um, and thirdly, they want the priority to be on LDCs. So if there is any delivery um, in the current period, the focus should be on the LDCs, and this focus shouldn't be lost. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Faisal. Uh, and now we give the floor to Ambassador Lamna of Benzania. Uh, starting with the background information, which will be brief, because essentially it has been touched already by colleagues who have spoken before me. Uh, in the second area, I'll give a brief overview of some decisions which have been taken on measures in favor of the LDCs. And my third and last area will discuss the follow-up after MC8 decisions and the future of the multilateral trading system, or which I will constantly refer to as MTS. Now, Mr. Chairman, first on the background, uh, just to recap that the eighth ministerial conference of the World Trade Organization was organized against the backdrop of the deteriorating global economic and financial crisis, but also on the basis of the failure of the WTO to conclude the Doha Development Agenda, or DDA, for the last 10 years. Now, with that background, uh, my first task was to briefly discuss why it was felt necessary to convene the MC8, despite this uh, very gloomy picture. And I have five reasons which I've uh, recorded on my short uh, paper. First, just to emphasize that ministers need to receive reports on the negotiation process. Second, that ministers need to take decisions as they deem appropriate. Thirdly, that we expected ministers to provide political guidance uh, more than merely meeting twice uh, or rather once every two years as a legal requirement. Fourthly, that ministers would have the opportunity to deal with systemic and institutional issues. Fifthly, that we wanted to make sure that development issues remain at the center of the negotiations. And lastly, we wanted to send a clear message that the WTO is more than the DDA. So essentially those are the six reasons why it was felt necessary to convene MC8. Mr. Chairman, I also wanted to share with colleagues present that um, due to the deadlock that has been witnessed over the last 10 years, uh, I wanted to share with you something that has already been said by others, that we, uh, we were in a situation where we had two positions prior to MC8. One in which the developed countries pursuit of the mercantilist demands uh, with regard to market access were the, the main preoccupation. Uh, and the second position of the developing countries where we still wish to see development at the center of the negotiations. 
So these are the two contradicting approaches. And maybe at this juncture, I should just like to remind what uh, President Mkapa uh, told us yesterday during the opening session of this workshop yesterday, where he said um, that the developed countries have been questioning whether the emerging economies are indeed developing countries. And Ambassador Aga has also uh, made reference to the same this morning. So that's precisely why we find we are still stuck. Let me also add by saying that as for the LDCs, we have always been arguing that the single undertaking is not something that we are against. But certainly, if it takes 10 years to agree and move forward, then surely we need to have an alternative approach, which is going to endorse the single undertaking while also allowing for certain decisions to move on. Uh, and for that reason, since 2009, in the Trade Ministers' Conference held, the LDC's Trade Ministers' Conference held in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, we had come up with this wording called the early harvest, which incidentally, even uh, members of the WTO body, as, Ambas as Ambassador Ismail has just referred to, agreed in principle that at least for the MC8, we need to have an outcome for the LDCs. So this is a background which I thought I should also share at uh, the risk of repetition, of course. Now, the second part which I also wanted to discuss are the decisions on measures in favor of LDCs. Because indeed, in the last 10 years, and particularly after the July 2008 package, there have been definite positions that have been arrived at only that implementation or operationalization of the same has remained uh, unimplemented. I'll just give some examples. One with regard to duty-free and quota-free market access. You will find this in paragraph 153 of the draft modalities on agriculture and paragraph 16 of the draft modalities on NAMA, which state, and I quote, accordingly Developed country members shall inform WTO members by a date to be agreed of the products that will be covered under the commitment to provide duty-free and quota-free market access for at least 97% of products originating from LDCs. Blah, blah, blah. I don't want to quote the entire sentence. This decision has been there. Again, on rules of origin, here I would like to quote paragraph 152C of the draft modalities text on agriculture and paragraph 15C of the draft modalities text on NAMA, which again states, to ensure that preferential rules of origin applicable to imports from LDCs will be transparent, simple, and contribute to facilitating market access in respect of non-agricultural products. Again, a decision an agreement that has been on paper but has not been implemented. C, on monitoring procedures. Again, I refer to paragraph 154 of the draft modalities text on agriculture and paragraph 17 of the draft modalities text on NAMA, which states, I quote, as part of the review foreseen in the decision, the Committee on Trade and Development shall monitor progress <coughs> made in its implementation including in respect of preferential rules of origin. So there are such decisions which still remain unimplemented. <clears throat> Another area is on cotton. Again, those who spoke before me have already alluded to this. The Hong Kong ministerial decisions for an ambitious, expeditious, and specific solution on cotton cut across the three pillars of agriculture in the areas of market access, in accordance to paragraph 155 and 156 in relation to domestic support, also in terms of the export competition, which talks of prohibition of export subsidies for cotton and whatnot. What we are seeing to date is huge subsidies are still being uh, given to cotton farmers, to cotton exporters, but this is not augering well because in effect what it is doing is, is, doing is 
uh, affecting uh, African farmers on cotton who cannot afford to compete in this kind of situation. So we've been calling for elimination of uh, such subsidies which in fact distort trade. <coughs> then there's also the question of modalities on the special treatment of LDC's services. Here again I quote paragraph 9 of Annex A in the report of the chairman on services which contained which was contained in, 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 in the July document of 2008. And the major elements, again, are required for the completion of the services negotiations, which states that members reaffirm their commitment to fulfill the requirements set out in paragraph 9A of Annex C of the Hong Kong Ministerial Declaration regarding the development of appropriate mechanisms for according special priority including to sectors and modes of supply of interest to LDCs. And this is the most important part, modes of supply of interest to LDCs. Uh, here we are talking of uh, the mode four, of course, which is referring to movement of natural persons. And this is in accordance to obligations of Article 2, Paragraph 1 of the GATS in respect of preferential treatment benefiting all LDC members as the most satisfactory outcome of these negotiations. The fourth area is that of accessions, which again has also been touched by my colleagues. And let me just say that the process currently is cumbersome, and as a result, even Russia, which has recently been admitted to the WTO during MC8, has taken 18 years for Russia uh, to join the WTO membership. Uh, what we are saying really in the MC8, we have called for a revisit uh, of the 2002 guidelines <coughs> with a view to making them simpler, smoother, and easier uh, to implement. I'm happy to say that after MC8, we have had four new members, including Russia, which I've already mentioned, Montenegro, Vanuatu, and Samoa. The latter two, of course, are from the LDC uh, group. Mr. Chairman, uh, the last part of my presentation uh, is on follow-up of MC8 decisions and the future of the multilateral trading system. Here I would like to state that uh, decisions so far reached for LDCs only cover a small number of issues, which I've just uh, narrated. Some members during the negotiations have raised the issue that if LDC's package is approved, then there is a danger that they might walk out of the, of, of the negotiations, which we have repeatedly said this is not true, because we still have a lot of other areas where we have uh, interests, and so there's no way we can uh, chicken out of the negotiations. These areas include those in agriculture, in NAMA, in areas of rules of origin, implementation issues such as special and differential treatment, uh, and other critical uh, issues of developing countries. So in all these areas, we will still be there to continue with the negotiations. As for trade, for, uh, trade facilitation, that is also another important area. And in reply to my friend, uh, Ambassador Giant, uh, let me say, that in principle, we too in the LDCs support the idea that facilit trade facilitation will continue to be discussed. But what we were saying at the time before the MC8 was, and this I'm sure you will agree with me, there are too many paragraphs still in the area on the negotiations concerning trade facilitation. So we were saying for the MC8, we would not be prepared to start negotiating. <coughs> But otherwise, certainly, a number of our members, particularly those who are landlocked, will require trade facilitation as an important input. Um, finally, let me say, Mr. Chairman, that what is most important for us is whatever has been approved under MC8, first it is something that is still very little, but more importantly, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. We just cannot sit back and say that so-and-so items have been approved, so we sit back. We need to work more in these areas. For instance, in services waiver, 
we need to do the scheduling with those who are interested in offering services and countries which will be in need of our services. And so the, say, the case will also be for other areas. What is important is we must have a program of work or a roadmap that is going to say exactly what is going to be done at what point in time, because otherwise this may take so many other years to come. What is essential is it is always true that it is the devil that is in the detail. And this is something that we really have to keep ourselves abreast for the future months to come. And uh, let me conclude by saying that the future of the MTS has a lot of potential uh, if development is, it is prioritized as the focus in the DDA and that we should not really continue bringing up Singapore issues. Uh, we need to look more into SND, NDT, to developing countries, including the LDCs. We need to increase aid for trade, which will assist in addressing our supply side constraints, but also we need to enhance our uh, other development efforts so that the LDCs and other developing countries can take a bigger role. Uh, in my paper, I've just indicated that as we are talking now, the global share of the LDCs still stands at less than 1%. In other words, in the world of international trade, we do not exist as yet, something which we believe is very unfair. Of course, the MTS will also have to take into, con uh, into account issues on protectionism. Here a lot is being said, and every country developed and developing are saying protectionism has to be avoided. But I stumbled into some research that was carried out by St. Gallen University here in Switzerland, who have given ample examples of the number of protectionist measures that are in place, despite all the talk. So we really have to do something contrary to what is happening at the moment. Again, we have to give more priority to issues on climate change, energy issues, food security. These need, require, uh, need close monitoring at all times, even if they are not directly under the WTO, but certainly they have a bearing on what we are discussing under international trade. And all this, of course, will require continued commitment of our political leadership. Mr. Chairman, I wish to thank you and colleagues for your attention. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, and now the last uh, speaker of the list is uh, Angelica Navarro. Thank you, Martin. And uh, just imagine if it was difficult for Faisal. Uh, being the last is quite a difficult uh, time. I just wanted, to, um, but I'm going to try to do my best uh, not to repeat that much what has already been said. I just wanted to, to mention uh, some um, interesting words that I heard yesterday in one presentation, and that was by Mr. Recupero, that you all know, of course, from his previous work in UNCTAD and in his own country. And he did this, uh, he mentioned this very interesting word uh, that at the time of starting the negotiations, he thought himself, and he, and he mentioned, that maybe this was one round too much. And uh, why did he say that? Uh, well, among other things, uh, because all the implementation issues, as was mentioned by India previously, were not even complete. And uh, of course, most of our uh, countries were just uh, trying to cope with the previous round, the Uruguay round, and it was difficult uh, to uh, keep on um, just immediately to start uh, another round. And just to uh, continue with this uh, point, he also mentioned that apparently there was just one single country that uh, wanted to have a millennium round. And in those times, apparently, um, not even the U.S. was very enthusiastic, <laughs> since they already had had so much. Uh, why do I mention that? Uh, because I think that Mr. Recupero took in a very important point, and uh, is that what we were trying to do, and we're still trying to do with this Doha round, is to correct a profound imbalance on the trade 
regime. And uh, this imbalance, of course, covers the most important points that could not be negotiated before, that is mainly agriculture, but uh, of course uh, with the subsidies, tariffs, and so on. And uh, one question is why is taking so much time? And the other one is, of course, uh, is the result that we're going to obtain really development? And um, from Bolivia's perspective, of course, we have to keep on working mm -hmm. on the Doha round. Although I have to say that what we have in the table 